So when I started my career, I was 12 years old. Me and a friend of mine snuck behind someone's summer cottage into Point Judith Pond, a salt pond in southern Rhode Island. We were going to go digging for little neck clams with a bull rake just like this. How this works is you pull on that T-handle and you drag those teeth through the sediment. The clams pop into the basket. So there we were, 12 years old, standing in waist-deep water or chest-deep water, pulling on the, the handle. Every few minutes, you pull the rake up, shake the sediment out, shake all the mud out. And that day, every time I pulled up the rake, there was two or three dollars worth of clams in there. For the next 15 years, I would commercially harvest shellfish. Every year, I'd get more efficient at it, started scuba diving for them. People would say things like, it's great that you have a job doing something that you love. And I'd think to myself, I don't love this. This is just the best way I know how to make a living. Nothing to love about putting on a cold wetsuit early in the morning. But I was always nervous. I was nervous about how I would make a living. I'll never forget learning that a house cost $200,000. How was I ever going to afford $200,000? I was scared I was going to be homeless. It was a fear that drove me. I went away to college with some help from a Division II wrestling coach. I was a terrible high school student, but in college, I was going to prove everybody wrong. I was going to be a doctor. It was around the time ER came out. I think that had something to do with it. <laughs> and uh, I learned three things in Colorado. One is there's no way I'm going to get into medical school. Two is that financially, I was on my own. I had no safety net. I was racking up student debt, and that, that scared me. The third thing I realized was that I loved working on the ocean. I loved, I loved the, you know, the Rocky Mountains are beautiful, but nothing beats the Atlantic. So I came back to Rhode Island where I could harvest shellfish and pay tuition at the University of Rhode Island. I studied aquaculture and fisheries technology. Aquaculture is the growing of aquatic species. People grow seafood, fish, shellfish. People also grow things like seaweeds and algaes that are not only used for food, but used for everyday products like toothpaste, ice cream, even baby formulas, pharmaceuticals. Aquaculture is the fastest growing food producing business in the world. And, front slide. And in the next 50 years, we are going to have to grow more seafood than we've grown in the existence of mankind. The reason we need aquaculture is because there's a widening gap between the supply and the demand of seafood. If you think about the last thousand years, more and more people have gone fishing, catching more and more fish. People have gotten more efficient in the Industrial Revolution. We went from steam-powered engines to combustion-powered engines. We got more efficient at capturing fish. All the technology, sonar, radar, the boats know right where to go. They can see the fish underwater. They know the best fishing grounds. They remember them. And so year after year, more people go fishing. Year after year, more fish have been caught until about 20 years ago when we saw a decline or a plateau in some cases of the fisheries. However, the demand for seafood is not plateauing, it's climbing. It's climbing with wealth. It's climbing with people eating more health consciously. Seafood's a great protein choice. It's also climbing with population. So we have a widening gap between the supply and the demand of seafood. Interestingly, most of the population growth is happening in developing countries. Developing countries are a great place for aquaculture because they don't have as many user group conflicts as we do here in the US. We don't have people jet skiing over there, water skiing. They're more interested in growing food. So while I was at URI, I'm walking down the sidewalk in front of the Memorial Union. I got my head down, and there written in chalk was, it said, scholarship to study in Africa, some information about how to uh, how to apply. It was a website. I just figured out how to use the internet, not because it just came out, because I, I thought it was going to go away, and eventually I had to figure out, <laughs> I had to, figure out how to use it. And, and that year I learned, luckily. And so whoever wrote, got in their hands and knees and wrote that in chalk on the sidewalk changed my life. A few months later, I traveled to Cape Verde to study the potential of aquaculture in Cape Verde. It was there that I realized Aquaculture was not just a potential way for me to earn a living. Aquaculture was a potential answer to many of the world's needs. At that point, 
I decided my goal in life would be to help start farms in developing countries, to provide a protein source, and for poverty alleviation, and because I loved the adventure. Usually when I went on these trips, I learned a lot more than I taught. Farms varied in size from subsistence farms like the ones in this slide to industrial farms like the one on the top right of the screen. We are going to need to grow one and a half million tons more seafood every year in order to meet the growing demand of seafood. And we're not going to be able to just harvest it out of the ocean. We've maxed that out. We'll be lucky if we can persist at the level we're at. We have to grow it. We have to grow the seafood. And we have to do it in an environmentally friendly way. Not just to sound good, to say that, but otherwise the industry will shoot itself in the foot. We can't go peeling up mangrove forests or salt marshes because eventually we'll run out. So you have to remember, industrialized aquaculture is only a couple decades old. Industrialized terrestrial, traditional agriculture has been going on for hundreds of years. We figured out some really good ways of growing things, we figured out some bad ways of growing things. Fish farming has come a long way in the last couple decades. And don't take my word for it, if you look at the most um, popular website that shows the, uh, uh, the list of sustainable seafood, the Monterey Bay Watch, Seafood Watch, um, it, it lists most of farm-raised salmon are now listed as good choices or best choices. Fin fish farming has come a long way in the, next, the last 20 years. Fin fish farming has, still has a long way to go, too. Shellfish farming, shellfish farming is the epitome of sustainable agriculture. Aquaculture sounds like agriculture. Aquaculture is agriculture. And shellfish farming is sustainable agriculture. Shellfish filter the water eating phytoplankton, microscopic plants that are naturally occurring in the water, using them for growth, reproduction, energy. That increases the amount of light that can reach the seafloor, inc increasing aquatic vegetation. It also makes more oxygen available to other living things in the bays and estuaries, which are so important to our wild capture fisheries. There's 10 to 10,000 times more biodiversity within an oyster farm than there is in an adjacent water body. It increases the number of living things in an area. So I'm telling this to my buddy Cam, and he, he says, well, that's great. How are we going to increase seafood production by one and a half million tons a year, though? And I didn't have an answer. So I do what I always did. I, I called up one of my mentors, and I said, hey, how are we going to do this? And he said, well, you started a shellfish farm and a whole food production system with just one acre of pretty much barren sand flat. So tell your story. So here's my story. I graduated college and job offers just came pouring in. Yeah, right. <laughs> I continued commercial fishing, scuba diving for shellfish and working out on offshore fishing boats. This is one of the last fishing trips I went on. When we left port, the price of squid was $1.25 a pound. When we got back, we caught tons and tons of squid. When we got back to port, the price of squid had dropped to 30 cents a pound. So we didn't make nearly as much as we thought we were going to, but at least we made a paycheck. Some trips that I went out on, we wouldn't make any money because the boat didn't make any money because they spent more money in diesel fuel than they caught in fish. Everybody deals with uncertainty in their career, but when you're relying on wild capture fisheries, the uncertainty is tremendous. Luckily, at University of Rhode Island, I learned how to grow oysters. I started with a one-acre oyster farm, top left of the screen. You can see the, the first piece of gear that I put in the first one acre of oyster farm. And I gradually expanded three acres, seven acres, selling 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 oysters a year to local restaurants and then farmers markets and eventually wholesalers in Boston, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Washington, DC. I had grown a business that I wanted to ensure the future of. So I purchased the only commercial piece of property on the water, which was kind of an old rundown restaurant. I, I needed the docks, though. I needed those docks right there. And so I didn't have re any restaurant experience other than being a busboy at Chen's for one, one time. And, and so I didn't know whether the restaurant would work or not, but I know I needed those docks. I figured when it fails, I'll just live here and make it a fish market, but I need those docks. And today, the restaurant employs over 200 people. We were. Um, named top 10 oyster bar in the world by USA Today. Just yesterday, we received a...
Thanks to all of you. So we had the farm to plate theme and we brought our oysters into the dock and, and that was kind of unique. And then we grew, we decided we wanted to increase our farm to plate appeal. So we started growing organic vegetables to increase how much farm to plate we were doing. And, and, and so these fields hadn't been farmed in hundreds of years and now we're harvesting hundreds and or tons and tons of organic vegetables out of this farm to supply to the restaurant and also to local farmers markets, uh, provide the customer with a f uh, fresher product, a better product. And, and, and the oyster farm has increased production to well over a million oysters. In Rhode Island, shellfish aquaculture has increased production over 800 tons over the last 20 years. If in the smallest state in the country, we can produce 800 tons of sustainably grown seafood. As a global society, we can meet the growing demand of seafood one acre at a time. Thank you. <laughs>